So it was this huge hope somehow, maybe yeah, then a change is coming super fast. Even when we had this huge strike with hundreds of thousands of people in different cities, the politics didn't change. What are you going to do if they, if they don't respond? Hi, my name is Elias König. I'm a fellow here at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies and I study climate strikes. So I'm curious about the youth-led climate strike movement, particularly the last four years when young climate strike activists were able to do what veteran climate justice campaigners had not been able to do for years, which is to create a mass movement for climate justice. And for my project, I'm interviewing both climate activists that are active in the climate strike movement and also researchers that have already written about the movement. So the first question that we would always ask people is, why did you, you know, become interested in climate justice? I basically grew up with the climate crisis, seeing the impact of the typhoons on my community and my country, really seeing whole homes and communities and subdivisions just consumed by floods. If I had to name sort of one moment or one event, it was the, the Copenhagen summit in, in 2009 big political failure, obviously the summit, but uh, for me personally, um, it was sort of an initiation. A flood in Pakistan, flood in, in Sudan, and also a fire, drought. Right now, like in Kenya, we have a drought in the northern part of Kenya, and our government does, does not have any money. I guess it's not necessarily individual failings that we are in this situation. There are bigger forces. I think from a young age, really wanted to like, yeah, just try and do things or, you know, just like call out injustices. And so that, that I think, made me also then predisposed to activism. So for this interview series, we try to really get a global perspective. So we try to get people from all continents, from different contexts, to speak about what climate strikes mean in their communities or in their countries, how people perceive the movement evolving. 2017, 2018, there was a time when it felt like nothing was happening and you would read the reports, you would read the IPCC reports, the projections, and it would feel like, like, hey, like, am I crazy or the world is crazy? Like, why aren't we doing more? Why, why isn't everybody talking about this? And I remember when I read the news of like this young Swedish girl sitting in front of the parliament and um, saying like what's the point of going to school where there's no future and I remember how much it resonated and I was like yeah and I was like yes like if if it's and then and it felt like this is what was needed. Because what Greta did and the other one the, the other four or five ones it was a kind of super democratic invention because they didn't strike in front of the school they went to the parliaments addressing the, the ones in power at the same time they were addressing the whole population saying, we need everyone. And they were referring to the universities like the science, the teachers and the parents and the politicians had to react to these kind of uh, civil disobedience. Now, I will say that what the climate strikes advanced in terms of strategic politics was this idea of a strike, right? And how were they strikes? Well, it was students leaving where they were supposed to be and going out in the streets and causing a bit of disruption, right? Like around the time of Copenhagen, it was the like climate change seemed to be like something that that would happen in the in the far future and that we better prepare for. And I think for people who were eighteen, the perspective had changed, and it was much more immediately about their own lives. Twenty nineteen, the movement really reached a peak in terms of mobilization. In September twenty nineteen, six million people took to the streets around the world for for climate justice within a week. Um, and of course, uh, apart from Fridays for Future, other movements also really, really reached you know, their peak. Extinction Rebellion had big protests that year. Um, what happened then was that 2020, the first wave suddenly ebbed. And this was not accidental, this was due to the pandemic. So a big climate strike that was planned for 2020 had to be called off. And so we were curious, you know, how did the COVID pandemic affect the movement? I think there was something really special around that time because it was a time when the international movement came together more. Um, before that, there wasn't a lot of coordination, there wasn't a lot of communication, especially between global north groups and global south groups. I would say Fridays for Future started to be on the track of becoming more intersectional um, because 
you know, it's not just about the environment, it's not just about the future, it's also about socioeconomic issues, class inequality, gender inequality. It's not just like the greenhouse gas emissions, but it's capitalism, it's colonialism, it's patriarchy, and it's a lot of um, oppression system that are interrelated. During the Black Lives Matter protests, that really made an impact in Fridays for Future. Though. I think it made an impact across the world. It is a time of social awakening. I think the COVID pandemic also just showed how rotten our existing systems are, especially for marginally um, oppressed communities already. Fridays for Future MAPA uh, was like a demanding to transform the Fridays for Future movement because it's very like a Eurocentric uh, or it's very like a, yeah, centered to like, a, you know, the global north, but a- the actual struggle is happening in the global south. Yeah, we had a press conference with uh, uh, with uh, Greta and uh, after press conference, so we end up forming this map of most affected people and area. And the reason why we formed this, we wanted also for us to raise our own demands, to fight our own fight, and also to showcase what is happening, especially for most affected area and uh, people. If we look at the atmosphere, uh, the, the CO2 levels are still rising and the climate crisis is still escalating. So how the movement can try to really put more pressure on politics to really affect material changes. I think a lot of traditional activism and social movement politics assumes is that, all right, if we get a lot of people in the streets and cause a ruckus, you know, and like express our moral outrage, it'll push the politicians to change policy. If we just get enough people and raise enough awareness, things will change, okay? Um, And, you know, maybe this is a bit harsh, but I think that's a very naive view of how the ruling class and how global capitalism operates, right? Because if the ruling class is benefiting from the status quo, you can't appeal to that on a moral or even a rational basis, right? It is a self-perpetuating system. It's not going to matter if you express a certain outrage or whatever, right? Of course. While people brought up a lot of the same points, they also had different opinions, such as the necessity to have concrete demands or the forms of actions that, that should be taken. What I found interesting is that a lot of people still you know, talked about the idea of the climate strike, which I do think, um, and also for me personally, remains a, a very interesting point that the movement called itself the climate strike movement. I mean, obviously, if in the end, we're going to need something like a climate strike if, if we're going to get anywhere, um, like an effective uh, strike. And uh, the question will be, what, what, what could be actual demands that could be pushed through there? I think more and more countries are starting to have those really concrete demands and what it looks like. I remember opposed to the beginning of the climate movement when a lot of our answers were like, listen to the experts, listen to the scientists. Um, why are you asking us for answers? But now it's like, you know what? Sure, here, this is what we want, right? The climate crisis sort of like, I don't know, evolve or expand to, um, you know, to include, I guess, people that you won't necessarily think of as environmental activists. There is such a direct effect, right? The people who are actually directly being affected by like sort of like, the smog and the the fumes coming out from like the industries, people who are like more vulnerable to like different health issues and things like that. Um, And then they also, for example, had like a nurse speak and how um, the healthcare system cannot cope with all the people who are coming in related uh, to like the climate crisis. When we say like uh, we need system change, yeah, we really need to change how we produce stuff and how we organize our economy. We should be engaging with um, workers' struggles uh, because it's connected. We cannot ask for climate action to global leaders without prioritizing like indigenous rights because what I have seen is that many activists ask for leaders that do this energy transition, but what they don't often see is that this energy transition that is being developed right now through this green capitalism is costing the lives of of some people in global south. There is this enormous need of immediate change 
of the specific politics within every country. We have really to organize, not only to mobilize, but really to organize a broad movement um, for a strike together with the unions, together with the Black Lives Matter movement, together with the uh, indigenous movement. I think that's still the way to go.